Welcome to our online worship service at Bethel this week. Uh, I am so thankful uh, for those of you that choose to worship with us every Sunday. Uh, I know it's a little bit different. Uh, I've spoken to a lot of you and not being able to meet and, and worship in person or, you know, maybe because of health issues or things of that nature, uh, you know, um, I'm thankful that we are able to meet and worship online that we can still worship in God's word together and that we can sing uh, praise songs to him and, and just to worship him and Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for the opportunity that we have to worship and I thank you for joining us today. Uh, I pray that today will be a great time of worship as we continue on in our study of the book of James. Let's ask God to bless our time together today. God, you are good all the time, and we are so very thankful that you are consistent in your nature. God, that we don't have to wonder um, from day to day or moment by moment of, of what you will be like. God, because your word tells us that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, so we thank you that you are consistent in nature and character. Lord, you are always good and always perfect. Uh, so we worship you today, and that's our declaration. Uh, is that you alone are God and there is no other. So, Lord, we ask that today as we worship you, that you would be glorified and that you would speak to hearts and lives of every man and woman and boy and girl uh, that worship with us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Bible uh, and turn to the book of James. Again, we're, we're continuing today. Uh, we'll be in James chapter 3, but just to, to kind of set the tone for this morning and the text that we're going to see, one major theme that James has throughout his writing is the need for consistency. Uh, the consistency and alignment between a professed faith in the actions of our daily lives. Uh, there are a couple of places that we've seen so far where James has really emphasized uh, the need for consistency. 
You remember in, in James chapter one where James said, if any, of you last, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. But then James says, ask without doubting. And, and the doubting that, that James is characterizing there, uh, faith says yes. Doubt says no. And then in, in verse 8 in chapter 1, he says, if anybody doubts, he is a double-minded man. And, and the picture of a double-minded man is very inconsistent. It's a man that says yes, no. Yes, no. No. And, and he wavers back and forth. And James says, hey, as you have faith in Jesus Christ, the, the things that you ask of God, as you ask for wisdom, ask with faith. Don't waver back and forth. And then again, James challenges us in chapter two for the need uh, of, of consistency in our lives. He says, hey, some of you profess faith. Some of you proclaim that you have faith and trust in Jesus Christ, but you show uh, favoritism. Uh, toward toward rich people, you know, toward people that you like, you you show favoritism, and that's not consistent with the nature that you should have, resulting of faith in Jesus Christ. And then again, in in chapter two, James says, "Oh well, you know, you profess faith and and you claim to have faith, but you have no works." And, and that's inconsistent. James says, if you really genuinely put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then works are going to come right alongside of it. Works will be the evidence of your genuine faith. The last couple of weeks, we've been talking about the tongue. Two weeks ago, we, we talked about the power that the tongue has, that, that it has the power to, to change the course of uh, lives and families and churches, communities, that the tongue has great power to either point people toward Jesus Christ or to push them away. Last week we saw where James talked about a, a wildfire, how great a forest is set on fire by a little flame, a little spark, and how our tongue, if it's not controlled, it has a great potential for destruction for bad, to tear others down and, and just to leave behind it a wake of, of damage and destruction. Well, as, as we join together, James call for believers. Hey, you have faith in Jesus? Live like it. Let your walk and your talk align. As we get to the tongue and we start thinking about that consistency, in today's text, James challenges believers toward consistency in speech in our daily lives. So if you're in James chapter three, let's begin reading in verse one. James writes, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses, so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. Verse seven, for every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Let's pray and ask God to uh, speak to us this morning through his word. 
God, we do thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, just the simplicity that James writes with, the very practical and direct approach. God, I thank you that uh, it's easy to understand, but Lord, it's so difficult to live by. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just take the truth that, that your word is, Lord, and, and shine it into our hearts and lives. Lord, help us to see times that we are inconsistent in our speech to where we're double-tongued, God, to where we speak out of both sides of our mouth. God, I pray that your word today would be strong, that it would be mighty, Lord, that it would uh, correct, and that you would give us, Lord, grant us repentance, Lord, to turn from our sin and to follow you, to trust in Jesus, to do that great work that only he can do through our relationship with him. God, I ask that you would speak over these coming moments. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So let's just, let's go to verse nine today, uh, the first verse in our text. And James writes, he says, speaking of the tongue, he says, with it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. I'm sure that we can all think of someone in our past, in our life, uh, someone who spoke out of both both sides of their mouth. Uh, somebody that was, was hypocritical that might say one thing but then do another. Um, you know, somebody who was very inconsistent. I want to share with you a story uh, from when I was younger. I was probably middle school age. Uh, and as many of you know, I grew up in church, uh, but I didn't have a personal relationship with Christ until after I was out of high school. But I knew a lot, of, a lot of truth, you know. I mean, I could answer lots of questions and things of that nature, uh, but it didn't affect my life to where at school, um, you know, I didn't always talk about the greatest things and I didn't use the greatest language. Uh, I played sports and, and a lot of those guys that I was close with, you know, they heard me say things that I really shouldn't be saying. Well, one day there was, there was a guy uh, that I went to school with and he invited me to church. And he said, uh, yeah, hey, Brian, you want to come to church with me sometime? And I told him, I said, well, I, I mean, probably not. I, I already go to church, uh, you know, and I told him the church that I went to. And he looked at me and his eyes got big and he said, you go to church? And I said, yeah, I go to church. I think that's exactly what James is talking about, where he, where he says, you know, somebody that, that says one thing or professes one thing, but then there is no consistency to back it up or to bear proof that what they said was genuine. You know, that's exactly what James is addressing here. So he says, with our tongue being double-sided, our tongue, we, we bless the Lord and we curse man. Traditionally, uh, in the Jewish culture, they would recite and say, uh, a course of, of 18 benedictions. A benediction, it just means a well saying, you know, statements of truth or encouragement. Uh, they would daily say these 18 benedictions multiple times. It was tradition. It was uh, what they did. A lot of times it was very legalistic, you know, and they thought that they needed to do that to be right in their relationship with God or that God would be pleased with them because uh, they recited these sayings every day. Well, at the end of these 18 benedictions, uh, Jewish tradition says that, that the Jews would say, blessed be thou, O God. Okay, so there were multiple times a day that, that good Jews would say these benedictions and then bless the Lord at the end. But then with the very next breath out of their mouth, you know, they would, they would talk out of the other side of their mouth and and. They would curse man. And James says, look, on, on one hand, you bless God. And then on the other hand, just the very next moment, you curse man. Uh, it, it could have been out of anger. It could have been gossip or slander. It could have been lying or, or putting others down. You know, there's, there's any number of things that we can say with our words, uh, our speech, that would curse man or go against uh, blessing God that would be inconsistent. And that's what James is really pointing out is the inconsistency between a mouth that blesses God and professes a relationship, but then turns right around and bears proof 
that it's not really genuine in the way that they treat and interact with others. You know, maybe in the way that they put others down to make themselves feel better. Uh, that can be a common problem, that inconsistency in our speech, uh, especially for believers. You know, sometimes we try to say the right things or put on an act or, or to wear a mask and say the things that we know that we should, should say, but our lives don't really bear proof of those things. I was talking to a friend a few weeks ago, and uh, he, he was telling me how he works with a couple of guys who are bivocational pastors. Uh, you know, they have a, a secular job and, and they work. Uh, it's kind of in the construction field. Uh, and, and he was telling me as we started talking about the tongue and speech, um, I, I was sharing with him, you know, things that I'd been preaching and, and things of that nature. And, and he said, you know what? I work with a couple of guys who, who preach on Sundays. They're pastors bivocationally at churches. And uh, he said, but you know what? He said, during the week, Monday to Friday, they talk just like everybody else. And, and he was almost ashamed because he is a believer. He is a Christian. And, and he saw that inconsistency in these guys that, that profess to be Christians and, and even preach. But there's not alignment between what they say they believe, what God's word says in their lives their actions. So I, I think that we should all take caution and consider whether or not there's consistency in our words. James right here, is, as he talks about this inconsistency, it ties in with the last two weeks to where James said, hey, your words are powerful. Your words have, have the ability to point people toward Jesus Christ and to build them up. Or your words have the, the same equal power to tear people down and push them away from Christ. So James is building off of what he is, has already instructed us earlier in chapter three. And he says, look, your words are very powerful and there needs to be alignment and consistency in them. I think that we can all think about people, um, even Christians within church at, at different times that, uh, you know, would profess or claim to be a Christian, but then they didn't. That their life and their, their speech did not back it up. It didn't give evidence to that true and genuine relationship. And that's what James is addressing right here. In verse 10, he, he continues on and he, he says to the, the believers, the Jewish believers, he says, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. And this is very direct. This is very blunt to where James says, look, you bless God and you curse man. And that inconsistency cannot be reconciled. There's no room for it. You know, stop. It should never be that way. James is very emphatic here when he says these things ought not be so. The reason that James says that is because if, if we think back to the whole, the whole of the book that we've studied up to this point, it, we've talked about how the book of James is about living faith. But it's about placing our faith in Christ and how that transforms our life. It transforms our hearts and our life to where then it comes out and it's made evident in the way that we live. So here is James is saying this inconsistency, it shouldn't be this way. It's almost like James is asking the question, how can a transformed heart if you've placed your faith in Christ and your heart has changed, how can a transformed heart produce inconsistent and duplicitous two-sided speech? We know that, that James is not alone in this and, and this is a high standard that believers and followers of Christ are called to live by. Jesus even called his followers to a higher standard. In the book of Luke chapter six, verse 28, Jesus instructed his disciples. He said, hey, bless those who curse you, which that goes against everything that we would just uh, naturally think, you know, any way that we would naturally want to respond. If somebody curses me or they're mad at me and, and angry or they try to put me down, what do I want to do? I want to get back at them. You know, I, I want to, I want to, uh, they swing at me. I want to swing back. You know, I, we want to retaliate. We want revenge. We want to save face. We want 
to hurt them just in the same way that we've been hurt. Jesus says, hey, if somebody curses you, bless them. Pray for your enemies. And that just, it takes a very common worldview and sets it on it. It, it sets that worldview on its head to where Jesus says, look, as a follower of me, you're not called to live by the standard of the world. You're called to live to a higher standard, right? And, and we see it here in Christ's command to bless those who curse us. As followers of Jesus Christ, your speech should be different. It should not be inconsistent. You shouldn't speak out of both sides of your mouth in one moment, bless God and profess how great he is. And at another, you know, put somebody else down and, and you know, be uh, critical and harsh toward others. Jesus says, we've got to turn it on its head and, and through a relationship with me, you should live differently because of a transformed life. Paul also encourages believers in Colossians chapter four, verse six. Paul says, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. All right, and that's a great reminder for us, for our speech to always be gracious, to think about it as, as seasoning like salt. You know, uh, there are a few foods that they just absolutely need salt. You know, my kids, a lot of times, they'll want to add salt to their food, and, and sometimes they'll do it without even tasting their food. And I'll say, well, hang on. <laughs> Taste it before you add salt, because we know that too much salt is not good. But potatoes, all right? I don't eat many potatoes since I have diabetes, but whether it be French fries or mashed potatoes or a baked potato or hash browns, okay? Potatoes, whew, potatoes need salt, okay? Potatoes without salt are just not very good. Another food that, that to me just really needs salt is eggs, okay? I can eat eggs without salt, but they're not very good. You, you toss a little bit of salt on those eggs and it just, it, it, it makes them grow and brighten and, and they're just so much better. They taste so good. That's what Paul is saying right here about our speech. Our speech should be gracious and it should season everything that we say with salt to where it, it intensifies and just makes even greater those interactions and the things that we say. That should be a result of our relationship with Jesus Christ. James says, blessing the Lord and cursing man. It should never be that way. James says, faith in Jesus Christ. It will absolutely result in consistent speech. James gives us some examples here in the next couple of verses to help us understand this, this duplicitous speech, this speech that's, that's two sides of a coin, you know, that does not uh, mesh with one another. They're inconsistent. In verses 11 and 12, James says, does a spring for, pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. I want you to think about going to a spring and taking a water bottle. You know, if, if you're thirsty and it's a hot day and you go to that spring and, and that water's running clean and clear and you fill that water bottle up and you start to drink that water bottle and it tastes so great. It is refreshing and it is sweet and it, it just, it hits the spot. And you think, man, I want another bottle of water and you stick your bottle up underneath that, that spring to catch that water again and then you start to drink it and it's terrible. It's, it's salty and it's bitter and, it, and you spit it out. We know that if you go to a spring and fill your water bottle with water, the next water bottle you fill and the one after that and the one after that and the one after that, they're all going to be fresh water. A spring is not going to produce fresh water and then turn around a few minutes later and produce salt water. It's not going to happen. The next example that James uses, he asks, he says, can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Okay, he's asking questions here that people could relate to. They would understand. And it'll help us to, to understand as, as James phrases this question, if we think back to creation. Okay, so we know in, in the book of Genesis, in chapter 1, 
when God created the heavens and the earth, we know that God designed order in all of creation. On the third day, uh, it says that vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit, a phrase that goes along with all of these things is according to its kind. All right. And then on the fifth day, it says that the birds of the air and the fish and sea creatures of the, of the water were all created and they multiplied according to their kinds. On the sixth day, animals on land, living creatures and mankind was created and they reproduced according to their kinds. Okay, many of you have had gardens this summer and, and believe me, my family has been blessed by your gardens, all right? Uh, but did you ever plant corn and have tomatoes come up out of those, those corn kernels that you planted? All right, or, or did you plant tomatoes and have jalapeno peppers come up? Okay, no, and, and that sounds silly. We all know better than that. You know, an apple tree is not gonna produce pears, James is saying because God in creation built order into all of creation and things reproduce after their kind, the fact that nature itself is consistent and is very well ordered, James says God has designed us as believers in the same way. We as believers should follow after our kind. And if we claim to have faith in Jesus Christ, it should be evidence. We should reproduce that in the way that we live, in the way that we speak. Consistency and alignment, as we think about that being a major theme through the book of James, James hammers home that faith in Jesus Christ, a true and genuine faith where we surrender to him, to where we commit our lives to him and where we abide in him. We've talked about John chapter 15 with, with Christ being the vine and us being the branches. If we abide in him, then we'll bear much fruit. That's the idea and the thought that James has as well. James says, hey, if you place your faith in Christ and you have a genuine relationship, you're gonna produce the same kind of fruit that Jesus did. Not because of ourselves, not because we're able to do it, but it's because we're plugged into him and that's what will be reproduced. So James hammers home the thought of faith in Jesus Christ results in a transformed life. And that's really the big deal here in James chapter three is, is James spends almost an entire chapter talking about our tongue and the speech that we use, the things that we say. That's the big deal. But our speech isn't the main thing. Remember that our tongue, John MacArthur says that our tongue is a tattletale. And our tongue is going to tell on our heart. All right, Jesus says the, th the same thing. Jesus says, hey, from the abundance of your heart, from the overflow of your heart is where your words speak, is where they come from. So the tattletale of our mouth is going to give evidence to the true condition of our heart. So yes, inconsistent speech is a problem. But the thing that makes inconsistent speech a problem is that inconsistent speech shows an inconsistent heart. And an inconsistent heart that is not being transformed by Jesus Christ is a problem. And that's the root of the problem. So the past three weeks, as we've been talking about and focusing on the tongue, we've seen how it's powerful and how it has great potential for destruction. Today, we, we've seen the duplicitous nature of the tongue. The nature of the tongue is two sided. It wants to to speak blessing to God, but then turns right around. And says things and, and treats others in a way that it should not. Well, you know, James told us last week that that the tongue of man is it's a big problem. James said every, every animal and creature known to mankind has been able to be tamed, but no man can tame the tongue. So as we think about the, the, 
duplicitous nature of our tongue and, and how we talk out of both sides of our mouth. And sometimes we do use our words to point people toward Christ, but then there are other times where we use our words and it, it pushes people away. We have a problem. And, and the only solution is the gospel of Jesus. We talked about that last week, how on our own, because I can't solve the problem of my tongue, I need Jesus Christ to do it for me. And that's where being, having faith in Jesus Christ and that transforming work in our lives makes all the difference in the world. Do you see inconsistency in your speech? You know, uh, does it shift and change moment by moment or day by day? Does something happen at work or at home that just makes you fly off the handle and lose control? Or maybe, you know, you, you have a coworker that, uh, you know, you, you want to tell a joke to that might not be the right kind of joke that you should tell. All right, I think that we're all tempted in that way, but we need Jesus Christ as the remedy to help solve the problem of our double-sided tongue. We need the gospel. We must run to Jesus Christ every single day as our solution. As we're wrapping up this section of, of the book of James, talking about our speech, I want to give you some practical help, some practical tips. You know, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm kind of glad that we're going to be off of the tongue because there are times where I've had to bite my tongue in the last couple of weeks. I'll get ready to say something. The Holy Spirit will remind me, but, but hey, preacher, you're preaching on the book of James. You're preaching on the tongue, you know, or, or maybe I'll, I'll want to respond harshly or to be short with my children and I'll have to, I'll have to stop myself. All right. So I've seen it in my own life and you probably have as well over the last few weeks. We all need help. Jesus is the solution. But I want to give you some practical tips as we try to control our tongues First, I think that we should take every thought captive. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, Paul writes, he says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You know, that's where I get myself in trouble sometimes because uh, what I think sometimes just comes out. And that's not a good characteristic to have as a follower of Jesus. It's not a good characteristic to have anyway. But if it's hypocritical claiming to be a follower of Christ, it can do great damage. Other people can observe it and it can be an issue in pushing them away from Jesus. What does it mean to take our thoughts captive when we think about something and we naturally want to jump in and say it? Pause. Just hit the pause button and I want you to ask yourself three questions. As you're thinking about that and whether or not you should say it, I want you to ask yourself, is this true? Or is it a lie? Is it kind? Or is it mean-spirited? Is it necessary? Or do I just want to speak to hear myself speak or maybe to build myself up? Okay, as we're trying to take thoughts captive, those three questions will help us. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? And as, as we get into a habit of asking ourselves those things before we speak, that will help us to bridle and control our tongue to where our speech, the things that we do say, will be seasoned with salt. The second practical step that I think we can take to, to help control our tongue is to talk less. All right? A lot of times we start talking and, and, and we get to talking and sometimes we talk too much. That's what Proverbs 10, 19 says. It says, when words are many, transgression is not lacking, okay? When we talk a lot, we end up sinning, all right? We talk a lot and we get ourselves in trouble. So take every thought captive, but maybe not talk so much. You know, think about it, cut back on the words that we say and, and try to make the things that we do say count, all right? Be intentional about the things that we say and the words we use. The third step, and I think that this is the greatest one. I should have put it number one, but I wrote it down as number three. This third step, I think, is the greatest. 
we desire to control our tongue, we need to ask God to help us. Psalm 141 verse 3 says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. All right, each day, I think when we wake up, we should just say a quick prayer before our feet even hit the floor. We should say a little prayer and say, God, today, close my mouth and do not let me speak when I don't need to speak. Set a guard over my mouth and and keep watch over the door of my lips. You know what? James says when we need wisdom and we ask God, God will give it generously when we ask in faith. That same principle applies right here. When we ask God, God, help me to control my tongue and to bridle my speech. Help me to be intentional in the things that I say. God, set a guard over my mouth. And if if I'm getting ready to say something that I shouldn't say, tap me on the shoulder, convict me, prick my heart and say, whoa, whoa, whoa. And do you know what? He'll do it. God will do it when we ask for help. So first, take every thought captive. Next, talk a little bit less. Third, ask God to help. And then fourth, and I think this is a big one too. Fourth, I think we need to practice not listening to an uncontrolled tongue. To not enabling others to use uncontrolled speech. Okay, so many times we may hear the Lord's name in vain or we may hear gossip or we may hear slander or untruth or we may hear uh, somebody being mean and putting someone else down. You know, we may hear those things. Well, sometimes we may even think to ourselves, well, that's not really any of my my business. They weren't talking to me, you know. Pray about it and ask God if you should, in love, okay? In love, if you should, confront. All right, I'm not saying go out and pick fights and go around to everybody you hear saying, oh, don't say that. Oh, you shouldn't. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying maybe it's a coworker, or maybe it's a family member, okay? Maybe it's a, a classmate at school. You know, those that you have a relationship with, when you hear an uncontrolled tongue, we shouldn't listen to it. We shouldn't support it. If we hear an off-color joke being told, we shouldn't slide our seat up and, and you know, want to hear the joke and laugh about it. No, instead, we should try to Use the truth that we've seen in the book of James and not listen to those things and not enable others to have an uncontrolled tongue. All right, these things, they're not always easy. It's not easy to think before you speak or to talk less. Okay, it's not easy. And sometimes we may not even want to ask God to help us to set a guard over our mouth. And sometimes it's not easy to pull away and not listen to and enable an uncontrolled tongue. But I think that if we follow those principles, it will help us more and more to control our tongue in a way that we would point people toward Christ and not push people away. All right? And it all goes back to that genuine faith placed in Him. When we spend time with Him and that relationship is right, our heart and life will be transformed and our speech will be gracious and seasoned with salt to where it will make everything better to those around our lives. We will be an encouragement. We will be a support and we will be a builder instead of one that destroys and tears down. Such challenging words the last few weeks from James. I pray that we will learn them, that we will uh, strive to live by them every day and that we would be people who have controlled tongues that point people toward Jesus. Pray with me. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the challenge that James has set forth the last three weeks. God, I pray that you would help us daily to abide in Jesus Christ. Lord, to take our thoughts captive, to talk a little bit less. God, that you would help us to be dependent on you. God, and to daily ask you to help us to control our speech, and our words and our tongue. And that, God, you would help us to have the courage to not support and enable a duplicitous tongue or uh, an uncontrolled tongue in others. God, I pray that 
you would do this great work in the hearts and lives of your people for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.